And recently, for another project, I actually put them all in database. And for the first time ever, I have all of my shows I've been to in database. So I've been able to uh, sort them and come up with some t statistics for tonight. Uh, first of all, I've been to 325 shows in this building, which is uh, probably not as much as, uh, as Don Law or certainly the stage managers, but I spent a lot of my life in this place. Uh, and going back and looking through those records, I wanted to look through my records rather than the internet. I know everything's true on the internet, but I still wanted to try to reach for a, another source. Uh, briefly, when this place went over to rock and roll, it was called 15 Lansdowne Street, just for a few months, from the fall of 1980 till January 81. Uh, then it became the Metro, which it, it remained from February 81 all the way to 1989. Uh, then there was a big renovation with a big new roof. It was city in 1989, and it remained city until the fall of 91 when it was renamed Avalon. And next door, of course, Spit was the club there, uh, 1980 to 1987, and then Axis was uh, 1987 on. And then the House of Blues came in February 1909. I remember that night because I emceed, and I can't believe it was five years ago. When did that happen? You know? So the cool thing about coming here in this club, uh, for me, is a, this was even before BCM, was I was spinning punk rock, and this was a place, especially Spit, where bands who were coming over from England during that explosion of music, during the punk era and the new wave era, and bands working their way up through the Boston scene could play. It's a pretty small place, and as a DJ it was great because you could actually spin records there. We didn't have a place where you could actually, unless you were a dance jock, but as far as if you, if you were a rock and roll punk jock, there was no place to play records. There was a, a place down in the uh, financial zone called The Space, but they were you know, only here for a little while. So it was very cool to come in as a DJ, play records, till the band went on stage. And then when the bands got more of an audience, moved up, they would move next door and play Metro. And this place became the stepping stone between the Paradise and uh, the Orpheum Theater. And I saw so many bands make that move through here. Uh, some of the bands, I mean, there's so many bands that we saw here, but uh, many of them post-1979 were legendary at the time. Many became legendary afterwards. Uh, one of the first shows I saw was in St. Patrick's Day, 1981. Um, Prince played at Metro. It was his Dirty Mind tour. The entire audience was gay. Uh, there was no crossover yet, and within five minutes he was stripped down to his uh, G-string, uh, dancing around on stage. You know, people don't react so much, you, you're not reacting so much because everybody goes out nude on stage now. But back in 1981, not too many people did it. Uh, that was an amazing show, and he would actually come back in 1986, which was well a couple of years after Purple Rain. He was huge. He came back just to do a small room with the Revolution which is one of those amazing shows where I was so psyched to have a ticket. I was walking down Lansdowne Street here and someone offered me $500 in 1984 money. Well, that's, what is that, 1000 20000 now? Uh, no way I would give that ticket up. It was just one of those great shows you had to see, Prince and the Revolution. A lot of people forget. Yeah, he was. The stage was The stage was that high, yeah. You can, you know, you come in and the renovation would happen. You'd be walking in, the stage was over there. Now the stage is over here. It's like, what are they doing? Where? Yeah. And there was that crazy spiral thing that went up to the DJ booth too. That was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of people forget you two played here uh, at the Metro. It happened on May twenty eighth, nineteen eighty one. Uh, I remember that because I emceed that show, and uh, the band hired a piper to bring them on stage. And I think it's the only time that you two ever did I'm a Believer by the Monkees. <laughs> I'm pretty sure is the only time I think they decided they better not take that any further. But uh, I got it on tape, it's pretty awesome. Uh, some of the other bands, Stevie Ray Vaughan played here. And um, geez, I gotta tell you, Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, he, he did a BCN show, we gave away the tickets, and so it was a smaller venue than what he had played before. Um, so we gave away all the tickets, and. Charles Lacordaire was going to MC the show, and I love Charles to dearly. I love him. Uh, but sometimes, you know, he's, he doesn't put two and two together. Uh, might have had something to do with some of those magical substances from the Tea Party era. Um, but you know, when, you, when, when a band says they've got their own guy that's going to introduce them, like they've got their own guy, that's okay. 
what, what you do is you go out five minutes before because the boss always wants you to say the call letters at least three or four times, you know, WBCN, yes, WBCN, WBCN. Uh, so usually that's what you do. You go out and say, hey, everybody, five minutes, we're going to be uh, doing a show, so go to the bathroom, get your drinks, and WBCN welcomes you to the show, and have a great night. Well, Charles decided he wanted to go up there when the lights went down, which means he was going to introduce the guy that was going to introduce Stevie Ray Vaughan. So if you can imagine, you're in the audience, and you're like, Charles comes out going, how you doing, everybody? Hey, welcome, you know, having a good time tonight? Well, put your hands together for Pedro Martinez! <laughs> and everybody in the audience is like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and then Pedro did his thing, and it was okay, but it was, it was one of those wonderful Charles moments. Uh, Tool played here, Radiohead as well, Stray Cats, the Ramones, Eric Clapton did a show here. Uh, even a flock of seagulls played here. Unbelievable, can you imagine that? Uh, with that? They played Iran three times. Three times, <laughs> right. Twice in the set, once in the You know, a lot of the English bands used to do their hit twice, because they were used to doing that, or they didn't have enough, mu enough music, so they had to do everything again. I remember, Tim, do you remember Johnny Cash? I do. Playing, uh, 90, it was 1996. He played, it was a snowstorm. I remember uh, we were over at BCN just hanging out, waiting until the show started, so we walked over, and I was amazed. There was, I don't know, six inches foot of snow. I was like, there's no way they're doing a show tonight. But there it was. There was his black tour bus, the black 18-wheeler, the man in black, you know, June Carter, the Sons. They did the full show. Uh, and, you know, most of the people came out, no matter, you know, even though the snow was very deep, everybody came out. And uh, it was just amazing. And I actually got backstage, and, you know, we all, a lot of us here have met a lot of rock and roll people and stars, and you pretty much know what to say or say something anyway. But... Cash was one guy where I just became like this uh, ten-year-old child, you know, just like help me, you know. And so, uh, fortunately, there were some people that broke the ice, but he was a gentleman. He was awesome to me. So I mean, you can this, the range of groups that were in this club or, or these clubs was amazing. Johnny Cash to Susie and the Banshees, incredible, and probably the most energy I have ever witnessed in one enclosed space ever occurred on April 8th, 1992, over at Axis when Pearl Jam played. And I'm, I'm certain that the, um, that the uh, uh, fire code was followed and that there wasn't one extra person in that place, I'm sure. But everybody was hanging all over the, uh, the, off the pipes and it was just unbelievable. Pearl Jam, when you think about where they went, only weeks after that, it was amazing that they ever played a place like that. And then the WBCN Rumbles, finally. And you know, a lot of you, or all of you know what the BCN Rumbles were all about. Finding, uh, uh, taking 24 Boston bands over nine nights, six nights of preliminaries, two nights of semifinals, uh, a night of finals, and finding the band. And it was great. And BCN did nine Rumbles here from 1981 to 1989. Uh, we moved from the Rat over, I remember I ran one, I ran the last Rumble at the Rat in 1980. And uh, it was great to come over here, because uh, I remember loading in for sound check. You used to have to be there when the bands were loading in. And I remember sitting at the back, looking out the back door. And to the back door, the rat would go out to that parking lot that faces uh, the Mass Pike. And it was about, I don't know, four in the afternoon. I was just sitting there. I was pretty tired, because you know, if you were in charge, you were doing nine nights. like the, you know, And so I was probably five or six nights into it, a little pie-eyed. And there's a... There's a uh, a pipe that runs over the doorway and just like in the logo this big ass rat came walking out across the pipe while somebody was loading in underneath him I'm like wow am I seeing another one another it was like elephant walk with rats walking across so it was very nice to come over here so uh, uh, we had a great time here and used the different clubs and different uh, permutations uh, it was a real endurance contest it was a real endurance contest for the uh, set crew uh, for the stage crew for setting everything up because on the finals you would have the two final bands and to make it as fair as possible you would do two alternating sets or you do uh, one band and the next and first band and the next so each is doing a 45 minute set so the crew really has to hustle because then we have a special guest band playing afterwards and while the guest band is on uh, the judges are upstairs deciding who won and then when the guest band gets done, you announce the winner. And you don't want to go too late or everybody starts leaving. And 
you know, you don't have your big, you know, moment. So in this particular occasion, which is one of my favorite moments in this place, it was 1984, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts were the guest band, and uh, two, the two finalists were the Schemers and Dub Seven. They, were do they did their sets, they finished up, the judges went upstairs, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, there's that room between uh, Axis, well, Spit, and Metro at the time where the bands used to get ready, because uh, oftentimes they use the upstairs at Spit as a backstage. And so everybody's getting ready. I think Carmine was the stage manager at the time. And everything kind of, was it, was it you? Oh, Were you on that? Okay. So what happens is the band's ready. You got Joan Jett and the Black Hearts, which is often hard to get the band out of the dressing room. You get them downstairs. They're all ready to go. The set's being changed on stage. They got Joan Jett and the Black Hearts. They got the, they got the drums set up. Everything's ready to go. Uh, the lights come down. They put on Joan Jett's introductory music. Everything's ready to go. The band included me in their high five, which is very cool. Whenever that happens, that's that's you know, that's that's religious. You know, you gotta appreciate that. And so we're ready to go. And so the music they're playing is "Won't Get Fooled Again." And Carmine's like, gives me the. He didn't have a flashlight. He just or if you. Uh, both of us. Carmine was there too. He's doing lights. Go. Time to go. Lights are down. Crowd's going crazy. Let's do this. And so Joan, I, I, I moved to go, and Joan, she goes, "No, don't go." I look at her. I go. Oh, she goes, this won't get fooled again. I go, it's an eight minute song, right? We gotta go out. She's like, no, no you can't. This, we gotta hear it all before we go. I'm like, okay, all right. And so, and the stage managers are, are let's do this, let's do this, the lights are down. Of course the audience, they clap so long then they stop clapping. The lights are still down, but Joan Jett, held out, she's like, no, we're gonna hear the whole thing before we go on stage. And, you know, Roger Daltrey's scream in that song is probably the, the greatest scream in all of rock and roll. And at the end of it, to see Joan Jett over there with her guitar on, which is not plugged in yet, doing the big Pete Townsend windmill, and jumping up and down, and looking at me and saying, now we go, <laughs> was one of the great moments on a legendary night in a place that had many legendary nights, and it deserves, uh, it deserves being commemorated. So thank you very much. Well, we could go on and on and on, but um, now we've got to the moment where we're going to unveil the marker. You'll see that there are a lot of names of different bands on there. Um, you know, as you were going through your litany, I said, oh, gee, we should have put them on there. We should have put them on. It's impossible. Uh, 325 shows is that I, I think that I think that's the record but um, this place has been um, a remarkable center not, not only for the music went on this building but as a result of it this whole part of town became a whole entertainment district you know beyond baseball which is you know entertaining in its own right it certainly has been in the last few years more so maybe than in the past so Harry why don't you come over here um, and we'll we'll do this together, but we have to be oh. careful. You don't knock it down. Now you want it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, hold on, hold on. And here. Now, one thing I gotta say. <laughs> but wait. Oh wait. Tease. But wait. But first, this is a blow up. This is not the actual marker. This is two feet by two feet. The marker is a foot square, and that's not an accident because the dimensions of the actual marker, a foot by foot, is the size of an LP sleeve. Uh, and many of us remember point. LP sleeves. In fact, they're coming back. So it's not a spinal tap moment. <laughs> yeah, so here we go. And you can come in closer and read it. Okay. Uh, then I'll come on that side with the microphone. Okay. Um, a former taxi garage behind Fenway Park became the center of a thriving nightlife district. Transformed in January 1969 into multimedia space, The Ark. It reopened in July as a Boston Tea Party when Rain Reapin, who got his name on there, moved that club here from the South End. Tea Party manager Don Law presented a who's who of music legends, and we, most of these people we're going to touch on tonight. And these are ABC, get it? The Allman Brothers, The Birds, Eric Clapton, to The Who, Neil Young, and Frank Zappa, and you know a million groups in between. By 1971, the Tea Party closed. 
The room is a disco before impresario Patrick Lyons opened the Metro Spit complex. Over the years, it became City, Access, and Avalon, and plus the you know ancillary clubs in the neighborhood. That's not in the market. That's my comment. Uh, you run out of words here. Um, with performances by Bob Dylan, Lou Reed, Elvis Costello, Sonic Youth, Mission of Burma, Pearl Jam, Radiohead, Coldplay, Rihanna actually played Avalon Jesus. on the way up. I don't think she'll be back in the future. Um, and Dropkick Murphys, of course. Adele. In 2009, the old building was replaced with the new House of Blues, which Law opened with Tea Party favorites, the Jay Giles Band. And that really brings the story around. As they say in Hollywood, it's, that's the story arc. So there you have it. Thank you for coming. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> and we'll, we'll put this image up on our website, so if you want to look at it again, it's be there. We're at the Lansdowne Street Marker Celebration with Tim Jackson. Hello, camera, people. Tim was a key component, component. Let's just say Tim knows a lot about this street, this strip, and the music scene going all the way back to Intermedia. Yeah, well, you know, I've played so many clubs here with so many different acts, and I, I can't really remember the variations sometimes. I actually worked as an actor at Mama Kim's. Remember when Mama Kim's was in here? I built that. Yeah, and... Uh, it was the first play. I was in a theater company at the time and playing music. And the theater company, uh, we did the first show at Mamakin's. didn't last very long. But the intermediate story, I was in a band in Rhode Island, and we were like the biggest band in Rhode Island, but we came to, to Boston to record. And it was early intermedia, and our engineer sitting in his sunglasses looking really cool was Martin Mull. So let me just guess, <laughs> uh, what's your favorite band that you played with here? That you were in, not in this one well, you hung out with. You know, it's probably Robin Lane and the Chartbusters. I mean, we did so many gigs, so many tours, so many shows here. Such wonderful crowds. And it's got such a great history. And I finally made a movie of her life. And so that, that's a, a fond piece of history for me. And some of the other acts... I thought were fantastic, but you know what happens? Oh, no. they, it was great. They come you and did, they go. You did lunchtime <laughs> shows here for the radio yeah, station. Yeah, right, right, right. Several of those, and yeah. in, in, uh, I think that was also a different type of thing that this place had. Yeah. The, at noon, they were drunk and partying hardy. Right. And I think Robin played several of those. Yeah, we did a lot. We did so many of those things. Even spit and all of that crazy stuff. And Jerry Wexler came down to see us here. The legendary Jerry Wexler, and you know. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I think about all of the different clubs and all the different situations and all the different kinds of shows and venues and reasons to have shows, it kind of mind-blowing. Okay, so when was the last time you played Lansdowne Street? Was that last week or um, last year? I don't know. We did... Uh, you did the House of Blues here with uh, yeah. that event, the uh, one of the big events. Yeah, it was a BCN. Uh, I think it was a fundraiser for the documentary that Bill is doing on BCM. Right. I remember That's that what show. It was. That was That's super. What it was. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was a really fun show. Yeah. <laughs> so most of the revival stuff I think tends to be Robin Lane. Yep, you Robin know. Lane, the Chartbusters. You should check it out if you yeah, haven't seen yeah. it, heard it, do it. The documentary is called? Oh, the documentary is called When Things Go Wrong, The Robin Lane Story. Check it out. It's definitely not boring. Guaranteed. And it's got a good history, a huge arc of music history through it. We passed through the Boston scene, yeah, so.